Love is a burning thing, and it makes a fiery ring. Bound by a wild desire, I fell into a ring of fire. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire. The taste of love is sweet when hearts like ours meet. I fell for you like a child, oh, but the fire went wild. I fell into a burning ring of fire, I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire, the ring of fire. It is... June 18th, 2019 at 116 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. Uh, this is Mitch Miller's podcast, The Black Hole. It's the story of how a handyman slash artist decided to become a coal miner so that he could retire with a decent savings. Just got off my shift. Tonight I was on the belt crew. We were in 8W though, where I've been working on the uh, section crew. And uh, the mining in 8W has advanced, so the 8W crew had to do a power move, which means they move the uh, power center that distributes all the power to the machines. You see all the machines that are the shuttle cars, the loader, and the miner all run or all have cords that are connected to the power center and you string these cords up on the roof and the ribs and uh, anchor them for the shuttle cars which are moving back and forth and they retract back into the machine as they move ideally uh, AW crew was doing a power move where they moved the power center up I was on the belt crew where we were extending the belt further and deeper into the mine so that the shuttle cars don't have as far to go to dump the coal under the belt. Uh, the shift foreman was really riding my ass tonight. I had to unload stands which weigh about 100 pounds. Uh, I had to unload them myself on my shoulder. Um, really worked up a hell of a sweat at the beginning of the shift. Then uh, we were having trouble with the scoop pulling the, extending the uh, belt out so that we could build structure in between the belt because you have to assemble it in between the belt. Uh, the scoop to give it its uh, fair, in all fairness, was pulling 80 blocks of belt. So that was quite a pull and I'm sure it gets difficult at this length to pull it out further and further but we did hook two scoops together and got it pulled out <coughs> so we built structure and then I built uh, my first K wall which is a temporary wall they put up in the cross cut for ventilation purposes and uh, spray foam that in so uh, but join me tomorrow night when you learn about Union wage negotiations and sabotage in the unnamed mine in western Pennsylvania. 
June 19th, 2019 at 12.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. You're listening to Mitch Miller's podcast, The Black Hole. And tonight I want to talk about wage negotiations and sabotage. You see, last week on Friday, before the bell rang at the start of the shift... There was an impromptu union meeting in the shower slash locker room. A statement was read about our union wage negotiations. It was about how if there was an improvement to the existing contract, no uh, necessary vote would be taken and uh, they would approve a an improvement on the contract and what we got was because the contract was up in August we got a 50 cent per hour raise starting August 15th of this year then in on January 1st of 2021 we would get another 50 cent per hour increase Plus, uh, our birthdays would be considered a paid holiday, which used to be the policy, but the paid holiday for birthday was taken away. Now, what you need to know is that there hasn't been a wage increase since the year 2016, and the current year is 2019, so for three years there was no wage increase. So a lot of these older guys that have worked here quite a while, at least three years, saw the 50 cents as a slap in the face. Does that uh, warrant sabotage? I'm not one to say. From my perspective, I'll be three to four months in and get a 50 cent raise, and then after that it's a year and a quarter which the corporate standard is a raise every year at a year and a quarter that's not so bad I'm still on track for 50 cents per year Um, why the working man doesn't get a raise every year like the corporate standard I'm not sure doesn't seem fair but uh, as a 35 year old person who's been through a lot of things I know that life just isn't that fair so now on to the sabotage as I said I worked with the 8 West crew last week uh, all three days that we worked and uh, yesterday before shift on Monday before the shift or I mean after the ringing of the bell for the shift there was a meeting of the 8 West crew you see the uh, mine supervisor uh, the mine foreman the shift foreman and another shift foreman were all in on the meeting and the 8 West crew was in there as well it seems production is down and traditionally the 8 West crew is the most productive of of all three shifts but they only ran 60 feet the past week and there were some minor issues and some issues with the crew changing uh, people leaving the crew but as we talked about this a wire was passed around it was a solenoid cable a wire that had been uh, snipped cleanly snipped and uh, they explained that the other night when the miner wouldn't tram right meaning it wouldn't move to the right the right side of it was disabled that this wire came from that and that it was clearly cut and the mine supervisor wanted to know what the deal was um, and he was pretty upset about it so there was hypothetically sabotage on either the day shift or on my shift even though I had no access to the machine 
It is June 20th, 2019 at 12.19 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. This is Mitch Miller's podcast, The Black Hole. Uh, Thanks for listening. And uh, last night was a little bit of excitement. Um, By the way, I just got off of my shift. I'm a 35-year-old becoming a coal miner. I'm an apprentice miner uh, for six months and then I can get my black hat after six months making me a full-blown miner, not an apprentice. A little excitement last night. A overcast fell in, caved in on the main line, the uh, 5 west line at the 6 block which is six blocks in from uh, six north so they basically the ceiling caved in and overcast is where they as I talked about there's entries and cross cuts where these intersect you could put an overcast to allow air to flow over to separate the air basically air would flow over the entry and keep going down the cross cut and enter into another entry so the overcast (coughs) excuse me the overcast uh, basically you dig a high a higher uh, roof uh, where the cross cut comes across the entry and then you build walls walls and a ceiling in the cross cut so that uh, air can flow or a or a conveyor belt can go over top and you can still get through the entry and all the air is separate, two separate airways. So that caved in onto the track, blocking the track. Uh, So they had shuttle cars, or they had man trips, and they had guys shuttling from the bottom 30 blocks up to the junction. Then from the junction, it was only six blocks in where the overcast caved in, so then they had uh, man trips on the other side of that, taking us in by into the uh, mine to do our work. So I worked with the belt crew last night, and we got to BT-21, which is a, it's like a bus. It has a cab that only holds three people, not six. It's like a half cab. And then on the other end is called a bill, and it just holds tools. It's uh, like a big open-ended bucket. (coughs) So we got to that, but because of all the traffic commotion and and the issue, we sat in a spur uh, for nearly half the shift before we could do what we were uh, tasked with doing. Um, A spur, by the way, is uh, a offshoot of track where uh, it, it there's a switch and it's usually in a cross cut and cuts across to the uh, to the other entry hypothetically but usually it's just the length of a cross cut and it gets you off the main line you switch the switch you pull the man trip up into the spur and then you switch the switch back to straight you always switch your switches back to straight so that nobody's flying along on the straight and gets thrown up into a, a spur uh, could get hurt. Anyway, what we did last night on the belt, belt crew was spot some cradles. Uh, these hold the rollers for the belt. They're pretty heavy, uh, about five or six of them. Then we detrashed the uh, tail tail pieces. Uh, then tonight, uh, not a lot, nothing real exciting tonight, except our man trip did break down. Uh, but what we did was uh, we shoveled some overcast where the belt goes over and overcast. We shoveled under those for compliance for the federal or state inspector. And we also drug about 10 blocks of uh, belt line, dr- drug the dust, and uh, left the man trip in to be towed out. Um, the black hat I was with tonight is staying in for four hours and I got to ride out. They started a new sign up sheet for four hours of overtime then you don't have mandatory overtime during the week. He signed up. 
It is June 21st, 2019 at 1.52 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. You're listening to my podcast as the... Oh, sorry. My podcast, The Black Hole, One Artist's Journey into the Coal Mines to Become the World's Most Underground Artist. I've logged quite a bit of time underground so far. Who knows if I'm the artist with the most amount of time, the deepest distance underground. Just got off my shift. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, Tonight, we, uh, a lot of the man trips are broke down. So we ended up waiting on bottom for about two hours before we could get a man trip. We had to wait for one to come out of the mine. Then, of course, it broke down just like last night. It broke down on us. Wouldn't take charge. Wouldn't run off the trolley pole. So we got on to 5 South and had to spur up and leave that man trip got a ride down to another one and got into 8 or 9W the long wall to do what we had to do which was replace one bracket that holds the trolley cable up and we were supposed to drag old railroad rail out out by because the long wall is coming out and getting closer to the main line so the rail line and all the lines that go further into the where the long wall started all come get dismantled and come out well (coughs) the rail that we were supposed to drag was not de-slugged and I'll explain what that is uh, but we ended up doing that for a couple for multiple hours. It's pretty labor intensive. So the railroad ties that you use in the mine are metal, and they look a lot like the roof and rib straps. Only they have little uh, little plates that are held on by slugs or lugs and these slip they these get hammered over onto the rails to hold the rails in place there's three of them one on the outside that's longer two on the inside that are that are shorter and can pivot on and off of the rail with a lot of force especially when they've been corroded and have been there for a while <coughs> So you have to take a hammer and hammer at these things, hammer away until they break free and uh, let let go of the rail. So that's what we did. Uh, I also want to explain what a switch is, because I explained what a spur was. And a switch, it's basically a lever that lays on the ground. It's got a heavy handle on it, it's about a two foot lever. It's got a heavy handle on it with reflectors on the handle. And uh, you pick that heavy handle up and flip it over to the opposite direction, basically 180 degrees. It goes up in the air and comes back down on the other side, and that switches the switch for the turn or the straight. (coughs) The reflectors on the handle are red and green, and green means that the switch is set for straight if the green reflectors are on top in either direction the handle faces you'll see green or red reflectors if the green is is on top that means the switch is set for straight if the red is on top it means it's set for the turn so worked with the track crew a little bit tonight learning about the railroad track and the trolley wire 
It is June 22nd, 2019 at 2.18 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA. Welcome to my podcast, The Black Hole. Just got off my shift in the coal mine. And tonight, uh, <clears throat> we were supposed to build a K wall where the uh, overcast caved in the other day, like I was talking about. A uh, K-wall is a temporary wall made out of galvanized steel, and I'll get into that in a later date. Then we were supposed to build six cribs, but these are nine-point cribs. They're not the Lincoln Log cribs with the uh, cutout fit together four pieces in a square uh, cribs. These are nine-point cribs, which are basically six-inch by eight-inch posts that are cut to about three feet and um, you set them three, three in a row, spaced about a half foot between them, and three, three and three across. Each layer has three, making nine points of contact. Uh, we're supposed to put this in the crib line, which is, <coughs> excuse me, where the where the main line six north heads north and then you go into a straightaway spur and then you have to rev you have to flip a switch uh, throw a switch to go on to five west uh, and that's where it's where uh, the man trips collect before they head out and there's cribs at the back of it so it's called a crib line well these cribs are uh, failing and we went to set these uh, cribs up we had to go get a motor and the car in the cars with the cribbing uh, from bottom and then we uh, backed them into the area then there were uh, metal tubing and steel pipes and stuff that we had to move out of the way well the the top the roof wasn't great uh, there were a couple bolts but uh, it didn't look great we were a little leery about doing it but we moved the pipes and then we started digging to set our cribs to get a level ground and as we were digging uh, one of the cribs that were was already up uh, the Lincoln log cribs actually fell and the roof fell in uh, right in front of us so uh, the black hat I was with called a boss and said, is this safe? You know, should we be doing this? So then the bosses came and helped us do it. And uh, I ended up getting overtime doing it. Uh, but uh, that's what I did tonight on shift. It was a little spooky, uh, but we got the cribs up, six cribs, and uh, now we're in compliance. So I said I was going to, talk about health care for the next couple weeks and uh, I feel that I've done a pretty thorough investigation of the health care industry in the United States of America uh, and in the course of my investigation one aspect of this is uh, direct payments to physicians from big pharmaceutical companies there are hundreds of thousands of physicians that take direct payments from pharmaceutical companies in the United States. And this is part of the reason I think the healthcare industry is broken and needs to be administered by the federal government. Uh, there are databases where you can look up these physician direct payments. Uh, some of the databases I looked at, they categorize the payments under five different categories, such as food and beverage consulting, uh, research, and there's of course a category of other. Now some of these physician payments are hundreds of thousands of dollars and they can be under the category of other. So my question is what is the other? The I ended up personally under the care of a physician that received four hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year from big pharmaceutical companies and I found a database that broke it down she was getting two thousand dollar payments per week 
from one company. She she took money from four or five different pharmaceutical companies, but that's almost as if she was on payroll with that company. Now, I also looked in, in, in my investigations into the Journal of American Medicine, and it's, it's known as JAMA, Journal of American Medicine. I forget what the last A stands for, uh, but this is a journal that uh, most physicians read and trust, and uh, not only is it filled, littered with big pharmaceutical company advertisements, but I looked on these databases into whether the editorial staff of JAMA was receiving direct payments from pharmaceutical companies, and of course about 90% of the editorial and writing staff were being paid by Big Pharma. So what does it say when the journal that physicians trust for their information, the writers and editorial staff are on the take from Big Pharma? It's a broken system, it's a screwed up system, I've seen it from the inside out, as I always do delve deep into the uh, inner workings of anything I investigate. Now how do we fix it? How do we fix health care? Well, here's my idea as, as to how you fix health care, whether you keep it private or make it public. First of all, you need to compile a database of standard procedures and operations how much they cost. Now, if you keep it private, hospitals could always charge more. But why not get a list of a database of procedures and operations for a 35-year-old male with blood pressure at this statistic, overall health statistic, you know, um, different categories and different prices in US dollars. How do you compile this database? Well, I had an interesting conversation with a state trooper once who was O negative blood type and he told me that it was messed up that the blood bank doesn't actually pay him for his blood since it's a universal donor. So I, it gave me this idea as to how you compile a database. Maybe the federal government should actually pay O negative blood types since they are the universal donor. They can their blood can be accepted by anyone, but they can only accept blood from another O negative donor. So their blood is valuable and I believe their body is valuable as well. So what I would do is pay O negative blood types. You could advertise are you O negative blood type and set up a system to pay them. Now Eventually this system might evolve to where they actually receive a check, but the, the way I suggest paying them is paying for all their fees, co-pays, anything that, in, any costs they incur from getting three separate estimates for a procedure or an operation. So they, you compile this database and you're getting three separate estimates in US dollars of a procedure that they need or a operation that they need. So that's basically my breakdown as to how you can, how the federal government could step in and compile a database, take on a project like that, and also how you could get a standardized list of the prices for health care. Uh, pay O negative blood type people, you know, you're isolating one portion of the population, but they'll be of all ages and health factors, and pay for all their co-pays, all their consulting fees, everything that's incurred for getting three estimates for a procedure. I mean, that's kind of the point of capitalism or private medicine is that you should be able to get three separate estimates and your health care provider should allow you to choose the best or the one you feel more, most comfortable with, the surgical team you feel the most comfortable with. And I would add that these O negative blood type don't, uh, should look up to see if their physicians are on the take from Big Pharma. Would you like to find out more about the most underground artists in the world? 
go to my website, www.plotm.com. Thanks.